Kathy Escobar co-pastors The Refuge, a mission center and Christian community in North Denver. She is the author of several books, including the most recent, Faith Shift, Finding Your Way Forward When Everything You Believe is Coming Apart. She's also a trained spiritual director and blogs regularly about life and faith at kathyescobar.com. She and her husband, Jose, live in Arvada with their five children. Let's give a very warm One Church welcome to Kathy Escobar. Come on up, Kathy. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. You're so sweet. <laughs> I am like the worst marketer, you guys, and that's just not my thing. Uh, but the truth is, is that I am really happy about this material. And um, it is really fun to be with you guys in Phoenix because I love warm. I live in Colorado, and um, I just love anything above 75 degrees. <laughs> it's perfect. Um, and I'm really happy because two of my friends from Denver came down. One used to live here and then relocated to be with us um, at the refuge. And we met a long, long time ago when we were kind of all in this crazy faith shift thing. Um, so the other thing that is, you know, interesting kind of coming in in this love, sex, and marriage, is that what it's called, um, series, is that um, that's a whole other topic. Um, and I'm married with five children, and this is our 25th year. Um, in September, which is kind of a big deal. There's a lot of divorce in my family on both sides of my side, and so it's like no small thing to be married for 25 years. Um, and there's whole other stories that we could talk about, um, about what it means to actually do this thing called relationship um, over the long haul. But <clears throat> one of the things um, that I, it all boils down to, so even in this conversation today, is that it kind of all comes down to vulnerability and honesty when we talk about love, sex, or marriage, or when you talk about faith. And the tr I hate vulnerability. I like to talk about it. <laughs> I like to create places where it happens, but actually living from that place is a whole other story because it requires so much risk um, and it requires so much of our heart and so much exposure, but it's also where all the juice and the good stuff happens. It just really is. And so um, just a little bit about me so you kind of know where I'm coming from. And, you know, today in the time that we have together, we can't really go into all the ins and outs of what's in Faith Shift. And so we're going to kind of do a big, broad overview. Um, but tonight, and Ryan will share a little bit more, but we're having a party at Nam Yoga to process this more. So that's kind of what my work has been in this last little chunk of time, is creating places to really walk through our vulnerable faith story. Um, with other people. So I've been in all these different cities where I have little pockets of friends. That's what's really fun about coming here is because years ago, like it's been a long time, and the refuge is nine years old, so probably eight years ago, um, somehow I intersected with this little group of um, fringers that were talking about these real questions about faith and doubt and church and life, and I just connected through them through the online world, and we became friends in real life. And so I've been down a couple different times to, to hang out with them. Um, but what I'm finding in these different places that I'm going is there's just so many people who are transitioning from what used to be to something different with kind of no map and feeling really crazy and really alone. And so I was telling um, somebody recently, like I was just in Seattle, yeah, it's like the same stories and the same desire, the same stuff, just, you know, rain or sun. <laughs> um, but just a little bit where I'm coming from, so you know um, a teeny bit about my story and, and my blog. I mean, that's one thing I've been blogging now for probably, I guess it's about seven years. And so um, it's interesting looking at my blog and kind of seeing the evolution over time. So I will just tell you that seven years ago, I was just mad and um, about so many things related to church and faith and life related to being part of a faith tradition that didn't feel like it could handle vulnerability. Um, and so, and I'm still kind of a pusher. I like to stir the pot and I like to say things that need to be said. Um, but it is kind of funny, like, in the olden days, I was just pissed. Um, and, and at the same time, here, standing here today, you know, being in, um, 
in church, and I've been with some different churches here in this last chunk of years, it's always fun for me to just kind of see that in different ways, people are still gathered, trying to grow, trying to learn, trying to live this thing called life with each other. And so I still have a really high value, despite some of my push, I have a really high value on community and connection, and I know I've desperately needed it in my life. Um, so the weird part about um, me in relationship to some of you that were kind of raised in the womb with church is that I wasn't. So, and that's one of the reasons actually I still believe, because it dropped into me without any external anything. And what that looked like, my family's from Northern California, um, and my mom was um, a single parent with two children before she met my dad. And my dad is, um, he's just an interesting person. He was like a real hippie in the 60s for reals. Like, he partied with Joan Baez. Like, that's the famous thing. Um, and, but he um, also, at that time in his life, was using a lot of drugs. Um, and alcohol, but he was so cute that my mom was like, yeah, I want to be with you, and they made me. I'm like the only child, um, but my mom also was like, I can't do this again, so four years in, she got out of that marriage, and um, so to this day, I'm 47 now, and my dad is a wonderful person, and I'm really grateful for him, and they have a decent relationship after all these years, but no, no sobriety, so he hasn't had any sobriety He's an alcoholic, and um, so the reason why I say that is that I had this missing thing in my family. There was just a lot of brokenness, and there was a stepdad, and he wasn't too good. There was abuse, depression, alcohol, just not good stuff in my house. On the outside, though, everything looked really good. It looked so good, and that was my way of coping. So my way of coping was peacemaker, put together, good girl, angel, Kathy. And um, somewhere in there, my, no one was a Christian in my family, but they were very spiritual, really spiritual. Like every spiritual book, every self-help book, like our bookshelves full of all of those things. And somewhere along the line, I'm not even sure where it happened, but someone gave me this little white Bible, and I started reading. And I was lonely in my house. There's a lot of chaos around. I had all this stuff going on, but I didn't really have any safe people to tell it to. And so um, I opened the book of John. Somebody must have told me this. And I did go to vacation Bible school like one time. I was in fourth grade, and I, accept, I prayed the prayer there. I show the kids sometimes. It was a Methodist church and, um, in Nevada, and I prayed the prayer. But, you know, to be honest, not one single thing changed because nothing around me supported that. But somehow I got this little white Bible, and I started reading the book of John, and I will tell you, I was drawn into Jesus drawn in. I was like, oh my gosh, he gets it. There was something about the way he touched the outcasts and the margins and saw things that nobody else saw and all that stuff. So this is why, one of the reasons I still have belief in me, despite doubts, because that was so pure, you guys. No one like taught it to me. I entered in. The, the story came alive. So, but nothing really changed on one level. I mean, let's just be honest, it just didn't. But there was a source of comfort. And I was drawn, like I have in my journal, dear Jesus, dear God, and nobody around me was using that language. And so I found some comfort in there. Um, so just fast forward a few years later, a ch oh, what am I hitting? Water. Um, a chunk of years later, and I'm in high school, and um, I ended up, my boyfriend's family went to this community church, and um, I met uh, Jesus in a new way in the structure of church. And so, and I came alive. It was really good. I needed it. And I was drawn in, and I liked to go, but I had a big problem in that season. And one was that I had all this stuff going on underneath the surface with my family all kinds of things going on on the outside um, that I didn't know what to do with because out here it was kind of like, God's good, Jesus is good, we're all good. And um, inside I had a lot of shame from things I had done. I had shame from things that were done to me, from living in the family. I didn't, didn't know what to do with it. Um, you know, long story, and I just, I always say this whenever I share, I've been telling this story for 21 years, and so don't worry about me in this moment, but it's significant, and it's because right before I went into my senior year of high school, I ended up pregnant with this boyfriend, 
his family's newborn again Christians. I'm a new Christian. I'm pregnant. I don't know what to do. I had an abortion. And there is a huge trauma in somebody's life. It's really hard to reconcile. And so what I did and why I share it, why it is such a big place of where I am now is that I learned how to split into two people. So I already knew before, and then I really knew. And I went all in on Jesus after that because, trust me, you want to make up for your mistake. And so that system, I went to Pepperdine University after that. We broke up. I was homecoming queen three months later, like literally. This trauma, huge trauma, nobody known. I'm like waving. Homecoming queen. Um, To redeem my life, to make something of it, I ended up on this big scholarship to Pepperdine University. I'm so grateful. It was a really good season. In there, I learned all these things about God that I didn't know. And, um, and that part was good. I went in, and in the book, I call this stage fusing. It was like where I learned certainty and conformity and affiliation, and I needed it. I needed rails. I needed boundaries. Um, and then I got married. My husband, so that's a whole other story. He's amazing, kind of came into this um, relationship and our um, journey together, kind of a Sunday Christian. Like, we would party all night on Saturday, and <laughs> you know, crawl with a hangover to church on Sunday. <laughs> and, um, but I was grateful for that because it was, it was some kind of rails, again, for me. And so when we got married, it was kind of like church is important. We ended up in a Bible study in San Diego, and he was in the Navy, and I started to learn, like, the foundations of faith. All these things just kind of started to come together, and I really liked it, and I really needed it. But you know, come back to my past, I was so good at doing what needed to be done to make it work. That was how, hey, so my family, and then now I just translated to faith. Um, then what happened is I ended up in this honest group at a church, conservative church, that started telling real stories. This is when things started to get a little weird, because I told my story for the very first time in church, and it was really scary. And, um, and at the same time, it was really good. There was this group of people that were talking honestly about real things, and it was, I was so hungry for it. But that was this little pocket outside of the big church. So I kind of call that season in my journey as the beginning of shifting. It's just where things got kind of rumbly and weird. I started asking things about the Bible, about um, uh, where was God really good? Why does God do, allow all these bad things to happen? Where was he when I was being abused? You know, all these things that I wasn't asking before. And, um, and so it, but I kind of just kind of kept containing it in that little container of being in my church because it was safe. It was safe. Um, then fast forward. All these years, I start talking honestly in church. And I keep getting push, 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 push. We need to talk about the Bible more. We need people to believe certain things more. We need people to get healed up so they can serve. And I'm seeing, in reco- I was in recovery ministry, I'm seeing healing, transformation, radical things happen, not only in my own life, but in others. Because when I started to be honest about my story, my marriage got better. My parenting got better. The rage that was inside of me started to dissipate. Things changed in a good way. But my systems didn't. And so um, in there, what I would always say is there became a split, even a bigger split, because I was experiencing transformation over here, and then the system that I was in didn't really acknowledge that. In the book, I talk a lot about returning. What happens sometimes when those rumbly things, you just return. That was kind of me. I just rumbly stayed. It's a better way to put it. And then now it's been nine years ago. I was on a big church staff. It's a long, crazy story. No time to talk about it here, but I will tell you that it was no longer like just shifty and rumbly. The reality of hitting against a place that could not really navigate the reality of real people's lives and transformation, all kinds of things about gender equality and power, and it just unraveled. And that's really what so much of faith shift is about, is when things just unravel, and we lose so much in the process. We lose beliefs, and then when you lose beliefs, you lose structures, and when you lose structures, then you lose friendships, and then when you lose friendships, you lose your identity. And for me, even though I had been pushing, and I had been stirring the pot, and doing all these things related into healing, 
it was like once that big thing happened at church, I kind of lost it all. And then I did what you're never supposed to do when you um, get fired and or asked to resign from a big church shop. We planted a church a month later. Like total ding-dongs. Um, but the truth is, is it's also been a place for the last nine years that I've been able to wrestle with some of these things. Um, when it's all said and done for me, the part that I keep learning, you guys, and I keep wrestling with in myself is that I, I always want to trans, uh, uh, compartmentalize God and others and myself because it's easier. And the systems, all the systems I was in up until now did that. There was kind of your spiritual life, your faith life. There was, you know, your relational thing. And then there was your inner thing. And actually, all the energy went to the God part because that's the easiest. Because that's what's on the outside. And the truth is that things couldn't be really untangled. Under, they're all tangled up underneath. And so the passage that I always come to back over and over and over and over again is Jesus when he said, listen, guys, I, it, here's, it's all in a nutshell. Here's what it is. You know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor, how? As yourself. And the truth is, I wasn't doing too good in that category for lots of years because there was this split. And so <clears throat> when it's all said and done, and this is not in Faith Chef, but I always come back to this imagery, and I think that you guys have it here. It is really fun to, funny and fun to be here because the refuge, our faith community, is like totally low-tech. <laughs> it's like we have an old TV like that has the big thing in the back still, the tube. <laughs> It's like so nice. Um, And so here's the reality. When I talk about that split, I think so much of our faith experience, life experience, how we intersect with God, this is why this does really fit into love, marriage, and sex, because it fits into relationship, is that we have what's on the outside, and we got a whole lot more going on underneath. A whole lot more going on underneath. And um, I think the world on the whole, and even us and me, I kind of like showing this part. And this is why in the stage of kind of fusing, what I call in the book, it's like built on certainty and conformity and affiliation. It's like the part that like you see up here, it looks good. But underneath for all of us is more going on. And so in, as we walk through the stages in the book, um, a big piece is that there is a desire for more authenticity, autonomy, uncertainty. And that ultimately, I believe, kind of rebuilding faith after unraveling and kind of as part of this whole messy, crazy process is a desire for greater freedom and mystery and diversity. And so, but the systems and things that we live in I have trouble with that. That's why I love that you are a community. Questions and doubts, welcome. And so, because there's usually a lot of them going on, no matter what. And that tying of God, others, and ourselves is so important to keep them all together always. That you cannot separate them out. You can't have your God life, your other life, and your personal life. They're all tangled out, and they're all going on underneath. And they're all really important. The other thing that I think was a really hard thing for me to learn, because I love splitting, like I'm a good splitter. And most humans are. We're really good at, we have one thing here and another thing here. And even if we say, oh, no, no, we're integrated, because I say that, I have a lot of split in me. Because that's human. There's a human part of making things simpler than they are. And so a concept um, that I really love came, I don't know when it came exactly, but Father Richard Rohr, who I love, he's a Franciscan priest, and he's a mystic also. And this idea of paradox, and that's that two contradicting things can exist in the same space. And for me, like a piece of my early story was anything to push out the ick and put on my game face. I just wanted this to be gone so bad. And then in healing, what I learned and in recovery, I learned is that both can exist. I can struggle and I can be okay. I can be weak and I can be strong. I can be ugly and I can be beautiful in the same place. But I'm just going to say that most systems don't know how to do paradox. 
and um, they want this and ignore this. And that really our faith journey, I believe, to becoming more healthy people related to God and others and ourselves, a whole person, is to continually push this up. And so all I will say about that, there's tons of resistance. There's personal resistance because it's so vulnerable. There's resistance from others. I will just tell you, people liked me better before. <laughs> they just did because I played the game so good. I was just such a good peacemaker. And so like showing up and saying what I really think and feel is like really challenging. Being mad, part of my unraveling in my faith, I, I was just mad because it involves a lot of grief. And, um, and I needed to be because I didn't know how to be for so long. There was something about that that's really important. And then the third thing is it's just messy. And we like things to be a little bit more contained. Um, so anyway, when we're honest, this is what I really think, all, no question, is that a big piece of our faith journey is kind of learning to live in paradox and just being more honest about what's really going on underneath here. And um, for, for me, like saying some of things, these things out loud, was, there's a cost to it, but there's way more of a benefit in the end because there's freedom. And I don't have to be split. I can be one person. Not either or, but both and. And so what it seems to be to me that a lot of us kind of have these feelings about God that, you know, are, they're, they're rattling around in our head and in our heart. Things about God, does he really love us? Why am I trying so hard and never really experiencing something new in my faith? I'm showing up and doing what I need to do. How, where does the Bible fit in anymore? Does it, is it for reals? Does it have mistakes? Does, what is it? Just what is it? You know, where is God and the injustice of the world? Where is he? Why is the church so jacked up? What am I supposed to what, what am I supposed to We all ask that every day. Um, what am I supposed to do with my questions and doubts? What am I supposed to do with them? And if I see him, like, how much is too much? And one of the things that I have realized, like, slip, you know, the slippery slope, you know, I have found that I've slipped off the slope, and I've found there's pretty solid ground underneath. It just is cushy. <laughs> It's just gushy. Um, about others, a big thing, and this is for me, if they really knew me, they leave me. They really knew me. When are they going to ditch me? How many of us live that way? Like, when we're just one mistake away from getting ditched? What if I'm not part of a church or group anymore? What does that mean? Huge one. They don't struggle like me. That's what I thought. I really thought I was the only one. And to be honest with you, I thought Jesus kind of, he, he took care of everybody else except for me. Like my mistakes were just like didn't count. I was exempt somehow from love and forgiveness and grace, but everyone else got it. It's so narcissistic, but it's so true. About ourselves, a lot of us, you know, I just feel like a crappy Christian. Because good Christians do this, good Christians do that. We compare ourselves all the time in that category. I'm not enough. I'm too much. I suck. I wish I were more this. I wish I was less this. These things about God, these things about others, and these things about ourselves, if we're really honest, we all, are always rattling around. And um, that, the church, in my opinion, community is supposed to be the place that we can wrestle with those. Because the truth is, if I could have I probably would, things just, I, I think the unraveling would have happened, but it wouldn't have been so dramatic. It's that I didn't have a place to really do it. And my experience has been that lots of people can't. And this is why the church, systems, groups, families, on the whole, even though we secretly want more, this is safer. Appears safer. It just does. So here's what I want to do, because I always like to kind of um, consider where we're all at together. It's really easy to kind of just sit and listen, um, get it out, and kind of go home. Um, but I know this. I know this, that there are lots of questions that we have about God and our faith, about others and our relationships 
and about ourselves that are rattling around. And so um, Stacy and Phyllis and Adrian are just going to quickly get you guys, and you, you can play if you want to, and you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, but I, I think it's good to sometimes consider what am I kind of wrestling with right now related to God and other people and myself. And so they're going to give you a pin and a card. And here's what I'd love you to do. This is really important. Just something that's no more than five or six words. A question that you have that's swirling around down here. It's swirling around down there. It doesn't mean that you haven't said it to anybody or talked about it. But it's swirling around down there. You don't know exactly what it means to push it up to the surface. But it's like down there for a reason. And think about you related to God and your faith. Other people, maybe a question you have in relationship right now. Maybe something about yourself. Um, And just take just a minute and write that down. And if you are willing, I would love to have you give them, you know, push them back down the aisle. They'll kind of go up. Then they're going to kind of come back again. Because I'd like to, um, I don't know if I'll be able to read them all, but I'd like to kind of share them together. Um, as we wrap up. So I'll give you guys a couple minutes to do that. Here's what's rattling around underneath the surface. Why is God so judgmental in some, ch- in some churches and so accepting in others? When will I ever feel clean enough? Faith baffles me, I don't feel it, though I'm envious of those who seem to have it. I love people, but I don't like being around them. (laughs) Why does a person whose body is dying and almost dead hang on to life, even though they can no longer move, speak, eat, or drink? Cancer sucks. God allows suffering. We need new beliefs as a species. Why don't more people get involved in church? Does morality change with the times? What is my purpose anymore? Am I a selfish wife? How how do I not be cynical towards humanity? Why do Christians believe they're right? Why do fundamentalists think the Republican Party supports family values when they clearly don't care? Parents raised Catholic, four children, three baptized, four, uh, the fourth has big doubts and questions. How do we make it all work? When prayers aren't answered the way we want, then what happens? Will God eventually save everyone? I really dislike my father as a person. What are God's promises? Why doesn't he give me the desires of my heart? What if it feels like he has broken his promises? Was all that serving and giving and learning a waste? How can I get closer to God to start my healing and love myself? God's help in our Islamic world. Who's really in control? Is there a plan? Death. A young friend is dying right now as we speak. Why does God allow kids and animals to be harmed? My faith is unsure. If we believe that God provides us grace for our mistakes, why is it so hard to forgive ourselves? And how long does it take for God to hear our prayers? Thank you. That's a gift to me. In these moments, the truth is, our only hope is to keep talking about these things in safe places. To push what's underneath up. But we have to be safe enough people to do that. And we have to find those pockets. I think that that's what you're trying to create here. Um, And I know that it's so important because we are not supposed to do those things alone. How we say, you know, one of the loneliest places on earth for, for me for years and years and years was church. It was the place where I couldn't talk about those things. And when I started to be able to, in a, in a little pocket of health, transformation happened. In the book, After Unraveling, a big piece of the material is centered on rebuilding. 
And the idea is just that there is a way to find our way forward, but that it'll look so different. Those questions that are there, there's not easy answers. So like the easy answers that came from fusing certainty and conformity, they won't work. They won't answer one single one of those questions. So we're going to have to wrestle with what that means with a faith that is filled with freedom and mystery and diversity. And I think a way that we can really, really continue to do that is to live in this tension of paradox. Kind of like vulnerability. I love and hate vulnerability. I kind of love and hate paradox, too, because it means I have to accept that both of these exist in my faith, in my relationships, and in my soul, related to how I view myself. Um, And one of my favorite writers in the whole wide world is Brendan Manning. Um, And he had a significant impact in the world um, over the years before um, he died. And, you know, when it's all said and done, what I love about him, and I did get to have lunch with him one time, and it was fascinating. It was a fascinating thing in this little room. You know, he just, he didn't didn't try and share any big wisdom or anything. He just, what he emulated was the tension of faith and doubt together. He really did. And humility, like this bended knee, this open, this I don't know. But I know, I know a couple things, and his was all centered on being loved by God, ultimately. Because when that one kind of gets stronger and stronger, we can hold the tension in so many other places. So I just want to close with this, because I love what he says about paradox. He says, when I get honest, I admit I'm a bundle of paradoxes. I believe and I doubt. I hope and get discouraged. I love and I hate. I feel bad about feeling good. I feel guilty about not feeling guilty. (laughs) Oh my gosh, it's so me. I'm trusting and suspicious. I'm honest and I still play games. Aristotle said I'm a rational animal. I say I'm an angel with an incredible capacity for beer. (laughs) To live by grace means to acknowledge my whole life story, the light side and the dark. In admitting my shadow side, I learn who I am and what God's grace means. As Thomas Merton put it, a saint is not someone who is good, but who experiences the goodness of God.